it's not so much that I discourage questions uh, during these reviews, it's just that I really don't have a lot of time. Uh, so, you know, if it's like a simple one word answer, that's okay. But if you ask a question that requires a paragraph of explanation, I just can't do that right now. So, here we go. Tell all the slides later. Uh, we'll start out pretty much the same sequence we covered stuff. So, you know, just in case we don't get to finish, you know, you, the stuff that you saw last should be most covered last to be most recent in your memory. So, something in the back of your head. Okay, so, where did we start with the cell? Well, we started on the outside of the cell, looking at the cell membrane. Remember, the cell membrane is a, a lipid bilayer. And it's composed of these uh, long molecules which have heads and tails. The heads of these molecules are phospholipid and tend to be hydrophilic, whereas the tails are hydrophobic because they're composed of fatty acids. So when you line these molecules up in two separate rows, you end up with two electron dense layers on the outside, those phospholipid heads, and one <coughs> electrolucent layer in the middle, those fatty acid tails. So when you look in, you see a dark layer, a light layer, and a dark layer. So it's trilamer, three layers, despite the fact that it's only two molecules thick. Okay. It's because of that spatial arrangement of those molecules. So. so is that like the nuclear membrane? Is it double layers? The nuclear membrane is basically the same thing. Okay. The nuclear envelope plasma membrane, similar structure. So nucleus, also surrounded by a nuclear envelope. When you look at the nucleus, usually when you look at close-up views, you're looking at an electron micrograph. So remember, the nucleus contains the nucleoplasm, which is separated from the cytoplasm in the rest of the cell by that nuclear envelope. And then you can generally also see a nucleolus uh, within the center of the nucleus, somewhere in the nucleus. Now, the nuclear membrane has some very specialized structures in it, which the plasma membrane does not. There's a lot of communication between the nucleoplasm and the cytoplasm. And that communication is through these openings, these nuclear pores, which don't show up very well in EM, but we can diagram them in this fashion. And these nuclear pores are actually made up of uh, rings of protein molecules, which form these openings or channels between the uh, cytoplasm and nucleoplasm. And these particular molecules that make up these nuclear pores are cleverly called nucleopores. And they're diagrammed by these blue blobs. <coughs> Remember, why do we have a separation between the nucleus and the cytoplasm? Well, the nucleus is where, the nucleus is kind of like safe. That's where the cell stores everything that is most precious to us. Mainly the blueprints for how to make more cells. And so that is in the form of DNA, which has been sort of diced up into these little packets of chromatin that you know as chromosomes. So when you look at uh, some of these chromosomes up uh, close and personal, you can see them in two forms, depending on whether they're active in uh, replication and synthesis of protein, or whether they're inactive. If they're inactive, they are in the form of heterochromatin. And in heterochromatin, we don't really see much going on. It's just kind of you know DNA hanging out doing nothing. But when chromatin becomes active, it unravels. It like opens up. And so then it is in the form of euchromatin and produces these what are called lamp brush chromosomes. And so you can see all these strands of chromatin. Remember, duplicate copies of chromatin can, are, are not necessary in the body, so they can become degenerate. And so in the case of females in particular, where you have two XX chromosomes, you only need one to be functional, so the other degenerates. So in many cells, you can see degenerate chromatin in the nucleus in the form of what we call the barb on it. It's basically a dark spot in the nucleus. And you could say, well, the, that dark spot looks an awful lot like that dark spot. And yes, I can see that's absolutely true. And I don't really know what the difference between those dark spots is, except this one's degenerate X chromosome and that one's not. And I don't know why. It's an electron. Move on. So um, that brings us to yeah, just memorize. There are certain factoids in life that you just have to memorize and not think too much about. It's like paying your taxes. You know, yes, you can try not to pay your taxes, but because it, it's just not going to be good after that. It's not going, it's not going anywhere, guys. So, <clears throat> ribosomes. Why do we have ribosomes? Well, because remember, the DNA is where we store the blueprints for replication of things. 
cell. But DNA is trapped in the nucleus and only RNA can get out into the cytoplasm. So if you want to produce proteins out of the cytoplasm, you need that RNA copy. Enter ribosomes. Ribosomes are little blobs of RNA which are used during translation of chromatin into proteins. So, where do we see RNA? Well, you can see uh, ribosomes, composed of RNA, floating around in the cell anywhere, but they tend to, uh, the RNA tends to aggregate, the ribosomes tend to cluster along the endoplasmic reticulum. And when they do that, that sort of studying of the ER with ribosomes results in the formation of what's called RER, which is shorthand for rough endoplasmic reticulum, because the ER now looks rough because it's got these big dark blobs along its length. And so you can see these dark spots on the electron micrograph, and they represent clumps of RRNA. Sometimes uh, these ribosomes will actually clump together in big balls, and when they do that, they're called polyribosomes, just because poly means many. And there's really nothing special about that. That just means it's a really big site of protein synthesis. It's very active. It's making lots of protein. Uh, next organelle in the cell is the mitochondria. Mitochondria are remember, the proverbial powerhouses of the cell. That's where the cells make energy. So you've got a couple of different options when you make energy. You can use anaerobic glycolysis. It doesn't rely on oxygen. And remember, the enzymes for glycolysis are out in the cytoplasm. But if you want to use aerobic respiration using oxygen, now you have to use your mitochondria. And so the enzymes for aerobic respiration for the Krebs cycle are tucked away inside the mitochondria. So when we look at mitochondrial ultrastructure, we have this outer membrane. And then we have these, the inner membrane that has these folds, or Christi, that, go, that are transverse across the mitochondria. And then in the middle of the mitochondria, between these folds, is this goo, this stuff called matrix material. And that's where the enzyme and the Krebs cycle are hidden. Okay? So the matrix material contains the enzymes for aerobic respiration. But even aerobic respiration only makes so much ATP. And the cell needs more ATP. So what produces the bulk of the ATP? Well, that is produced through something called oxidative phosphorylation through the electron transport system. And the enzymes for that system are located not in the matrix, but actually on the Christi themselves. So those enzymes kind of line up along the surface of the Christi. So after the Krebs cycle makes X amount of stuff, it can be transported to the uh, Christi for these uh, oxidative phosphorylation enzymes to kind of do the, the, you know, the final push and put out even more ATP. So that's why the uh, mitochondria are so effective. Is the enzyme that the elementary particles contain cytochromes? Cytochromes, yeah, sorry, I, I was a little packed up here. The cytochromes are the enzymes of the oxidative transport system that are producing all the ATP. Are the darker ones the spots in there or are those the very uh, some of those darker spots probably do represent <coughs> dense granules, but not all may. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Some of them do. We'll put it that way. Uh, this is kind of a recap of endoplasmic particular. I'm not sure why I did it in two separate places. I must have been having a senior role. Uh, so besides it, the rough endoplasmic reticulum that has uh, ribosomes along it, you can also have endoplasmic reticulum which lacks these ribosomes. And in this case, it's referred to as SER, which is short for smooth ER. Um, remember, ER is going to be a site protein synthesis in general. When you talk about smooth ER, you're talking more about production of some things like lipids and cholesterol and steroid hormones as opposed to actual proteins themselves. So the, the smooth ER is still a site of synthesis of uh, products for the cell, not necessarily protonation. Uh, and I realize in this photo my project, you could say, but those look just like those dark blobs that were along the RER. And yes, I'm very sympathetic to that fact. Um, this is one of the many reasons I hate EMs. Uh, if, if I were to show you something like this, and you can see these dark blobs, you know, call it rough ER, just, you know, play the odds statistically. 
If you see blobs, just assume they're real and you know, go with it. I'm not going to actually try to trick you in that respect. Believe me, there's plenty of other things to trick you up with. I don't have to try to trick you. So. Okay, so associated with the ER, once you produce proteins or cholesterol or lipids, now often the body wants to do something else with them. So we have post-translational modification. We can package them and we can do other things with them. We can phosphorylate these proteins. We can glycosylate them. We can do all sorts of things to them. So if you want to modify these proteins in some way, after they are produced in the ER, they get shipped to the Golgi apparatus. And they're shipped in these transport vesicles of various types. And so the Golgi looks very similar, but it has this sort of characteristic bowing appearance to it. And it's often associated with large numbers of membrane-bound vesicles on either side of it. So the Golgi complex is often divided into what's called a forming phase and a maturing phase. And that's because vesicles arrive at the forming phase from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the proteins are modified within the Golgi. And then they are released or exported from the maturing phase, or the trans phase of the Golgi. And so over time, because you're constantly adding membrane to the forming phase and subtracting membrane-bound vesicles from the maturing phase, the, the Golgi goes over time because you're adding membrane to this side, you're subtracting it from this side, so eventually it gets this concave or convex shape. Uh, now, of course, to compensate for that over time, we do have what's called membrane trafficking in the cell, where you can move membrane around uh, you know, to the cell membrane to repair defects from the cell membrane if you've got too much uh, cell membrane accumulated because you're exporting uh, cell products you know, into the extracellular space. So move bits of membrane around, and that's called membrane trap. OK, so that's pretty much it for the organelles within the cell. Now, we also have some miscellaneous parts of the cell that are uh, things like pigments. Okay? So these are non-living cell products, I guess, in one way to And the two most common pigments we see are melanin and lipofusin. It is possible to confuse these depending on the quality of the, the photomicrograph and or the staining properties. But in general, melanin tends to be more black-brown and lipofusin tends to be more golden-brown. So I would try to find a reasonable example that's clearly golden-brown or clearly dark black-brown for you to identify. Um, both of these pigments can be scattered throughout the cell, so they're not contained within vesicles or membrane bound in any way. Uh, and lipofusin in particular is commonly a degradation product, meaning the cell uh, degrades various products and phagolysosomes, and some of the residual <coughs> garbage is reserved in the cell and kept as a pigment, which is a lipofusin. So we see lipofusin very commonly in aging neurons in the body. And so Many of the photos you'll see with lipofusin are neurons, although these aren't, but many times they are. So here's lipofusin, granular, gold brown, and here's melanin. You can see it is a, a darker blackish brown. I guess I could mention that melanin is actually produced by particular cells called melanocytes, and then they share that pigment with other cells, but you'll hear about that when we get to skin, so not to worry about that. Okay, so that's it for things you should be able to recognize inside cells. So now we have, where do cells come from? Well, cells come from other cells. That's kind of like a circular definition about life, that living organisms come from other living organisms. You know, we don't have spontaneous generation. So it raises some interesting teleological questions. But that's beyond the scope of this review session. So how do cells divide? Well, they divide with mitosis and meiosis. Those are the two basic options for replication. So mitosis is where one cell wants to produce an identical daughter cell. So during this process, we have different phases. And those are interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Get that. Okay? You should have that memorized if you don't already. So interphase is what the cell does when it's not replicated. Inter means between. So interphase is the sort of between mitotic divisions. Uh, prophase, telophase, is the active synthetic replicatory part of cell division. So you've seen, when you look at a, a generic